Good afternoon, everybody. PC Outcast here, back with more ambition. And we've got today and tomorrow before we have another party. So, we definitely need to rest up tomorrow. So, let's uh, just see what we've got as far as gossip is concerned. We've got some shocking bourgeoisie gossip. I'm trying to decide what we should do with the bourgeoisie. So, like, right now, they're fairly powerful, but they're leaning towards the revolution. How do we get them to move towards the crown? Just don't know. I don't know. Look at all these people. Okay, so that's so far. We still have at least one more person we gotta meet. Anyway, let's go ahead and do some gossip selling. So if I use this, Petal Influence, so I can only increase or decrease their power. I can't move them in either direction. So I'm gonna sell... How old is this stuff? It's all the same. Okay, sell that. And... Sell that. And then this, I guess I'm going to decrease their power. I guess. Don't know what else to do there. I think, I think moving them towards, uh, towards the crown requires like events with maybe Anurad or others or um, something in during like a party. I mean, we're gonna be uh, going to the bo to a bourgeoisie party here, so maybe we'll have a chance. I don't know. In the meantime, let's rest up so we can get rid of. Our exhaustion. Oh. On the rod and uh okay, this is the sixth. Um yes. Oh, they're on the same day. I'm gonna take that. Sorry, madame. And then Antoine wants to get together on the 9th. Right before getting together with Alex. Okay. We'll give that a try. And Alex. Uh, sure. All of a sudden our stuff, uh, our uh, week filled up. We had nothing, nothing scheduled and all of a sudden, bam. Okay, so we are going to a bourgeoisie party, so we want to wear... Probably that. That is really quite an impressive dress. <gasps> yep, yep, let the la let the games, let the lames begin. Money, favor of honor rod, cheap gossip, cheap gossip, okay. We're doing honor rod. Due to flow of the party and the vagaries, va vagaries of guests wandering to and fro, you find yourself having a conversation alone with Madame Gazelle. Huh. What irritates me so is that all our co all their complaints about the aristocracy, there are more than enough powerful members of the bourgeoisie who clearly just want to become the new nobility. They play at revolutionary talk and preach about fairness, but they're not really opposed to the order of the ancient regime, merely those running it. As if titles bought with money were more virtuous than ones bought with blood, she sighs and takes a sip of her water. Now, I must admit that most arist uh, aristocrats I've spoken to are tiresome bores that get some kind of carnal thrill from reminding you of their privileged station. I've met some wonderful counterexamples, but it feels like a case of exceptions that prove the rule. Regardless, I am not even certain who I should be making entreaties to. All of Paris is picking sides, and it would be nice to reach out to someone who already has we already have a good relationship with. You could make me the new queen. 
whoever she reaches, whoever we reach, whoever she, whoever she reaches out to will surely gain from her support, but she might react poorly to suggesting someone that has a poor relationship with the bourgeoisie at the moment. Madame Gazelle swirls her water thoughtfully. If you want friends, it seems like the crown already favors you. Hmm. The crown, you say? Hmm. No, that can't be right, Yvette. She says with a furrow in her brow. The crown currently sees the bourgeoisie as a pact of overly ambitious upstarts. Damn it. Lost favor and credibility. Regardless, you have a point. I should still look at opening a conversations with my more tolerable acquaintances as soon as I can and see if that produces anything of value. They are the more stable solution for the troubles of France. Bourgeoisie has moved towards the crown a little. Okay, so that is what we gotta do. But it's funny that the crown... I mean, how do we even know what relationship the crown has with the bourgeoisie? We only see the allegiance of the minor factions. Anyway, okay. Well, we managed to move it a little bit in that direction. You chat with Honorad a touch longer until she excuses excuses herself to begin one of the very meetings she mentioned. And so another piece moves on the grand chessboard of Paris. The only question is, is anyone moving you around on the board? Probably. Cheap gossip, possibly some money. Cheap gossip, cheap gossip, money. Well, that's not very good. Um, as we'll take one that has no peril if there is one. There you go. You move between the richly pointed rooms of the grand house, one more opulent than the last. The tasteless excess of splendor is equal parts amusing and intimidating. Wealth wielded as a social weapon, without even the barest fig leaf of pretense. Amidst your evaluation, you nearly bump into a worried-looking man who barely seems to notice you. He's muttering something to himself while he stares off into space. Huh. Whatever that is, he says, finally looking you in the eye. I thought uh, that uh, coming to this party would, uh, may, might distract me from my troubles, but I was wrong. Now I am failing to concentrate on my work and failing to fulfill my social obligations. Yeah. Truth be told, the rumors I've just heard about my own business partner's thought tonight have only added to my list of woes should they prove to be true. Is there any chance you can take my mind off this building pile of misery? Oh, it's better to voice one's woes than run from them. What rumors have you heard? Huh. You think giving voice to these concerns will lessen their weight? <laughs> well, it's certainly a better idea than what I've been doing so far. He laughs before starting to explain the rumors about his business partners that have been bothering him so. While you pretend to lend a sympathetic ear to his plight, you hungrily drink in every last detail. When he finishes, you ask a few tame questions about his business and otherwise do your best to bolster his spirits. As soon as he seems less burdened by his woes, you excuse yourself and explore the rest of the party. Okay. Well, little... No, we lost some favor with Honorod. Sadly. That's a shame. Good morning, madame. Uh -huh. It's time for more money. Uh -huh. Okay, there you go. Enjoy. Um, Revolution gossip. This is the 18th. Yeah, it's coffee tasting. Sure. That's, that's a ways off. Now we need to rest up today, unfortunately. I can't really do any selling. But I do want to look to see... Nah, it made no effect. They ma they moved a little bit. It didn't actually move an entire slot one way or the other. Okay, rest up for tomorrow. In the morning, you wake to a letter, to find a letter already on your bedstand, sealed in plain, uncolored wax. The wax seal hasn't been stamped with the sigil of any sort. 
You recognize this peculiarly nondescript method of correspondence. When you open the letter, you see the handwriting. Your suspicions are confirmed immediately. This message is from Armand. Sheriff, I write to you now to explain that the situation has become extremely grave. Our Habsburgian society has fa was founded with the intent of achieving a great social change over the course of many years. These latest violent upheavals have shown us that our time is dwindling faster than we ever could have imagined. Simply put, our mission cannot be accomplished. Really? I know Joanna won't like it, but I need to try to push for something that's more achievable on our dwindling hours. I'll have to do this behind her back, but I accept the consequences for that. This may be her society, but its mission belongs to us all. To be honest, Joanna worries me not right now. She's growing more distant and agitated by the day. I know our circumstances are taxing, but something just doesn't feel right about her. Please stay safe. Love, Armand. Put down the letter and wonder about Armand's plans. Well, Armand, you've truly stepped into the viper's nest, viper's nest now. You shake your head to free yourself of lingering thoughts of Armand. He's made his decisions, and he will handle them himself. Instead, you focus on what else you plan to undoing for the rest of the day. And there you go. Okay, wardrobe time. You can finally wear something that this that we bought ages ago that the crown is going to simply love. Huh. <gasps> oh, oh, so Three turns. Shocking crown gossip and outrageous crown gossip. Cheap. Okay, going for the outrageous stuff. Uh, bonjour, Madame Dico, a, pa a patrician-like aristocrat says as he approaches you. At the risk of uh, being too forward, I've come to you to request a favor. Don't worry, it's nothing too scandalous. Given that you're attending a party connected to the crown and what your previous interactions with Marcel have been like, nothing too scandalous is already surprising to say the least. Oh ho! I have uh, recently arrived from Nantes. N I don't know how you pronounce that. Nantes? Nan Nantes? And I'm uh, in need of an introduction to that group of young women over there. He continues, pointing at a nearby crowd. You see, my son will be of marrying age soon, and I'd like to make sure that certain familial inroads are open before such affairs are fully upon us. If a nobleman from outside of Paris considers you a dependable figure for such a task, that really must mean that you have come become quite established here. It also might be possible to use this leverage to leverage some valuable rumors. Monsieur, uh, monsieur, I must ask you a few questions before I do so, is that all right? Hmm. You wish to know more about uh, me before we, uh, you'll agree then? <laughs> well, but uh, of course, as a gentleman, my character is beyond reproach. Please ask away, as I have nothing to hide. It's not a particularly long conversation. You ask him questions about certain current events. You supposedly gauge his opinion, but it actually allows you to form key details on a rumor you've heard scraps of earlier. Outrageous gossip. <laughs> With your objective accomplished, you proceed to introduce him to the group of ladies that he wished to speak to. His sudden presence is enough to raise eyebrows, but you manage to smooth things over, and soon several of them are already asking extremely arch questions about both his son and his family's finances. All things considered, that seems to have gone quite well. Okay. Money. Cheap gossip. Cheap gossip. Favor with Elizabeth, yes. I'm gonna do this. You happen across a man with an arrogant air about him talking to a woman. Well, it would be more accurate to say that he's talking at her. For her part, the woman appears to be doing her best to remain civil and just draw in her sketchbook. <laughs> and uh, furthermore, it would even be obvious to you that your work peaked. At the 1783 Salon. Why else would all of your portraits of women look the same after that? 
taking a moment to this is we finally are meeting at Madame Lebron. Taking a moment to acknowledge you with a nod, the painter returns to her conversation. Her reply is calm, almost bored. My clients address however they wish for their portraits. My role is merely to capture them as they are in their lives. It is, is it wrong that so many women wish to look like Her Majesty? Realizing the ground he's treading on, the critic's reply is suddenly more delicate. Uh, there's nothing wrong with an admiration for the Queen. However, that is not the point. The point is that you've reached your ceiling because you stopped focusing on your own merits. Instead, you choose to attach yourself to... I'm sure that this is really interesting to someone, but I'm done now. Madame Lebron replies, closing her sketchbook. She looks to you. Madame, would you like to talk somewhere else? Hmm. I'd love to. The critic sputters ignorantly. What? You can't just walk away from a critique of your work? You're not my teacher, and this isn't a critique because I don't want one. But! Critique is something you ask someone for. I never asked your opinion, so I don't need to listen to it. Um. Hmm. We have an appointment where we have to be anywhere else. Yes. I'll take on the, uh, the, the little bit of ah, vitriol that'll be thrown my way. The critic's eyes flash with barely suppressed rage, and he hisses at both of you. And laugh behind your hands while you still can. This self-importance of yours can't last forever, Lebron. Hmm. He storms off in an angry huff, leaving, finally leaving the two of you in peace. Well, that was satisfying to watch. I should invite you to some of my exhibitions. That's what we wanted. After a few moments of silence, she turns to you. Who are you, anyway? Do you remember that woman that Viscountess de Foy absolutely loves? Yeah, that's me. Huh. Viscountess de Foy? She murmurs to her. Why does that name sound so familiar? Oh! I painted a portrait of her a few years ago. I don't think it was, wasn't was my best work, but the pay was good. That must mean that you're Yvette de Co, I take it. Before you can reply, she chimes in again. Please, just call me Elizabeth. Formality doesn't suit me. To what do I owe the... Uh, what, to what do I owe this infamous honor? Um... How I rescue people from conversations with boorish idiots. It's kind of a hobby of mine. <laughs> oh, you like to play the heroine. He replies with a surprise giggle. Though, if you thought he was bad. Well, let's just say he's not even the worst one out there, and I've had a few years worth of experience to learn that. You chat a while longer, but find that you run out of common conversation points a little quickly. Still, it's pleasant on the whole. I'm sorry, but I must go. There's some other business I need to attend to, she says, inclining her head to the crowds of people scattered elsewhere. We're at the party. Perhaps I will see you... Uh... Oh no, this is me. Uh, ah, well, perhaps I'll see you again, Sam. Huh. Perhaps. With that, she departs, disappearing into the crowd. Okay. That, that went okay. Oh, we can actually do more with her. Cheap gossip. Cheap gossip. Cheap gossip. Yep. More Elizabeth. You notice the painter Elizabeth and decide to chat with her. However, before you manage to approach her, she glances about and quickly leaves the room. Confused but unperturbed, you follow her outside into the gardens. Approaching her, you survey the area and it seems that there's nobody else out here except for you two. Unless... Your heartbeat quickens when you notice shapes that mo might be following you, until you realize that it's a young couple giggling furtively between themselves as they disappear together into a hedge maze. It's safe to assume they'll be occupied with that for a while. Well, now you're alone with Elizabeth. When you finally catch up with her, she's circling a tree, staring pensively into its branches.
It's a fine tree. Are you looking to study it for a painting? Elizabeth looks over at you and laughs dis distractedly. I suppose it is quite beautiful. However, I'm looking for something other than natural beauty at the moment. My daughter, Julie... Uh, I thought she was like a teenager, but apparently she is old enough to have a daughter. Uh, well, I guess she could technically have a small daughter. At the age I thought she was, but anyway. My daughter, Julie, uh, wanted to come with me tonight, so I brought her, but I... But then I ran into a potential client. I must have gotten so distracted setting up a meeting with him that I stopped paying attention to her. She must have gotten bored and wandered off. I know how much she likes climbing trees, and a few moments ago I'm certain that I saw her little legs scurrying up this one. Now that I'm out here, though, I can't see her at all. <sighs> oh. Now I know why she was so insistent on wearing that dark green dress tonight. Here's some parenting advice. Never spend an evening teaching your curious and precocious daughter about color theory. Apparently all she'll learn from it is how to camouflage herself. I shouldn't have brought her here, Elizabeth says, frustrated, defeated. Oh, don't be so hard on yourself. You just want your daughter to have fun. Mm-hmm. She sighs, messy Boku. It's nice to know that at least someone here thinks I'm doing the right thing. I always attend these things by myself because I'm really here to find new clients to paint. Unfortunately, little Julie doesn't really understand that. She knows she just knows Maman is going to another fancy ball with all the queens and princesses. Every time she begs me to let her come along. She shakes, shakes her head and looks up at the tree again. <sighs> Why are children always so eager to grow up? Well, she asked me again today and I let her win. I thought that maybe she was old enough. Now I can't find new clients and my own daughter probably thinks my life is stupid and boring. You stand there and try to think of something to say, but you honestly find your parents' own lives pretty boring yourself. That's part of the reason you're even here. However, you are saved by the sound of rustling branches overhead. Mama! Thirsty. That's a voice from up in the tree. Huh. Jean, Lucy, Louise, the Lebron, is that you up there? Wow, that's quite a quite a mouthful. And I'm I'm just a bird. Tweet tweet. A bird who's thirsty. Mon <laughs> mon dieu, Julie. Do you have to have any idea how worried I was? Come down here right now. I swear I will climb up there if I have to, she says, slowly hiking up her skirt. Might be a good idea to intervene before Elizabeth is caught scaling a tree. Hmm. I mean, you can stay up there if you don't want to slice the queen's cake. I'd love to have it. What? There's Queen's cake? Huh. I mean, it's covered in special icing and honey. No, no. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, it's covered in special icing and honey flowers that you're not allowed to have anywhere else. But maybe you're just not old enough for it. Elizabeth chimes in. No, wait, I'm coming. <laughs> Julie scurries down the tree and returns to her mother. Elizabeth uh, mouths a silent, thank you, you, while she cleans some twigs and dirt off her errant daughter's dress. Uh, you've gained some favor with Elizabeth, and Julie has probably lost some favor with Elizabeth. <laughs> with her daughter uh, finally secured and accounted for, Elizabeth heads inside to the rest of the party in order to find some cake that looks suitably royal. You are left to your own devices and decide to head inside as well before the couple that disappeared into the hedge maze, hedge maze starts making too much noise. Wow. Okay, that was interesting. We gained... Uh, oh, it doesn't actually say how much favor we gained with Elizabeth, but it was quite a bit, I think. We, gained, we did get some outrageous gossip and some uh, cheap gossip as well. That will do. All right, we got two days. I guess we're gonna go do some selling. We really, I really need to say no to a lot of these things so I can do some of these side quests. 
Okay, outrageous crown gossip. We're gonna peddle, uh, actually, wait a minute. We're going to sell that. Um, sell that. And we're going to peddle this. Ooh. Oh, thank you, madame. Uh, this is exactly the kind of salacious trash we... <laughs> I think that's what he said. Ah, salacious trash. The best. As one might imagine, His Majesty King Louis XVI is a subject of much attention during the States General, which is by design. He is on a throne, which is on a platform at the head of the entire chamber. Much of royal power seems to come from making sure you can't be ignored. The daily debates over the details of extremely particular issues are dragging on for a long time. However, there's still a level of anticipation in the air. For most of the assembled representatives, this is their first chance to actually see the 33-year-old king's ability to ro rule in person. However, despite the drudgery and tiresome revisiting of the same issues over and over again, His Majesty has remained sharp, alert, and incisive. In incisive? There's been a variety of people who've dared to whisper that the king's been distracted, uh, vacillating, and uh, ir irresolute, but this latest display seems to have put a halt to such claims, at least for the moment. Crown has gained some power, revolution's lost some power. And unfortunately, I gotta rest up before. Whoops. Rest up before meeting up with Antoine and then also Alex as well. Just to see where things are at. Ooh, Crown is now at four. Revolution's at one. Unfortunately, the church is super weak. We need to actually build up the power of the church. Yes. Alright, well, rest up time. Sitting at your vanity in the morning, you read the newspaper while eating light breakfast that Camille prepared for you. Front page story is mostly concerned with a man who's been sentenced to death for treason. Apparently he has uh, the member, he was, the member of some nefarious organization conspiring against the king and their leader is still at large. Whoever this man is, you can't help but feel pity for him. You've heard grumbling on the streets that judges are becoming more heavy-handed with their charges and sentencing that they're hoping to keep order by making an example of a few criminals. You almost skip the article until you spot a name. No, it can't be. Yep. The now disgraced Baron Armand de Marbeau will be executed via beheading in three days time for high treason and conspiracy against His Majesty King Louis XVI. Oh boy. Well. Your blood runs cold as you read these words over and over. How? How would this have happened? You'd only just managed to find Armand and now he's going to be executed? How did he get caught? Did one of the Habsburgians sell him out? What happened? You frantically search through the article for any clue as to where he's being held. It appears that he's being kept in a Gut Royal watch station in the middle of the city, near the square where they'll soon decapitate him. This is Goodbye is now available to visit. If you hurry, you might be able to visit him one last time, but you only have three days before the worst occurs. Oh boy. Um. Um. Is that gonna work on this day? Because I don't think, no, we can't, we, we can't. We, we, <laughs> sorry Armand, we gotta date two other guys. <laughs> While you hang, no, he's not even hanging. He's going to be, he's going to be beheaded. Eesh. Well, that's not good. Um. Okay, so I need to wear something that the revolution likes. There we go. After spending the first half of the day getting ready, head out for your rendezvous. You're neither well rested nor exhausted. Nothing's holding you back. We're back at the Le Grand Danseur et du Roy with the man himself, Antoine. Antoine, tumultuous as ever, storms over to you. So, you've made it. 
Shall we? <laughs> you look ravishing, by the way. Thank you. Looks around. Not certain if he's examining the location or looking for <laughs> threats. Ah, I love Le Grand Danseuse de, de Roy. He laughs as a group of dancers take the stage. Don't let the name fool you. This place is a raw expression of the people's desire. In some ways, theater is more true than reality itself. Shows comical, stirring, shocking. The two of you are in, on your feet before anyone else yelling for an encore. A few hours later, you realize it's getting late and the two of you depart together. You feel like the day went quite well. That guy's crazy, man. Jeepers. Okay, well, uh, let's meet with Alex. I'm gonna wear, as suggested, I'm gonna wear the one that's in the worst shape, which is the provincial one. I have to buy some new stuff, actually. Fortunately, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, it's good to see you, he says, not even taking a second glance at your clothes. <laughs> ah, free-flowing free drink, rock is fun, and excellent dancing. It's going to be a great day. He orders a bottle of wine, and we're off, and we enjoy each other, and things went well. And there you go. Now, let's go. We're going to be super exhausted, but um, uh, do, I, do I still have today? The day has opened with staggering news. The king has just dismissed Monsieur Jacques, Jacques Necker, who was both the Prime Minister and the Controller General of Finances. Monsieur Necker's reputation as a friend of the people was so great that he was welcomed into office with a fireworks display. While it's understood that he was always a controversial figure, his com uh, competence was never, has never been in question. He argued for the abolition of serfdom, and once broke a policy stalemate, stalemate by leaking the national budget to the press in order to show the people how dire the country's situa situation really was. However, the pub this public favor uh, wasn't enough to save him. The king dismissed him from office, and the new controller general of finances is Monsieur Joseph uh, Joseph Francois Valion. Valion. Yeah, something like that. Dismissing Necker was already guaranteed to be unpopular, and replacing him with a conservative deeply loyal to the interests of the nobility would have been bad enough. But Monsieur Fallion isn't just disliked, he is despised. During the last famine, when asked if the plight of the common of the plight of the common people, Monsieur Fallion replied, If those are askers have no bread, then let them eat hay. Common people have not forgotten us. Oh boy. The great tension that hangs over the country continues to build. Even alone in your home, you can feel it in the air, heavy and thick like the smoke from a burning building. Oh boy. Okay, so we're being invited out by Alex and also a birthday. I ha unfortunately, I have no idea what date it is right now. Um, this is this is totally not possible. We need this day to rest between them. We literally have to turn both down. Uh, Antoine. Antoine wants to get together, let's see, 17, 16, 15, 14. Uh, sure. No, you know what? No. Ludovico, yes. Good grief. Okay. Let's go see Antoine. Actually, I mean, not Antoine. Let's go and see Armand off for the last time in the next episode. Thank you very much for joining me, guys. We'll see you tomorrow.